So, um, hello, I'm Rosie. Um, I'm a PhD student at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and today I'm just going to talk through my work, which is focused on the molecular modelling of biochars. Um, so I thought I should start with some background. Um, biochars um, have great potential to act as economical and environmentally friendly alternatives to activated carbons in uh, water decontamination. Um, but because of their wide ranging properties, um, not all biochars are equally effective as adsorbents. Um, so in order to optimize them for this, um, it's useful to understand how the different properties of biochars um, affect their adsorption properties. Um, and there's lots of experimental work focused on this, um, but very few computational or molecular modeling studies. Um, and so this is the research gap that I'm trying to fill throughout my PhD. Um, so the first thing that everyone might ask is why would we want to use molecular modeling to study adsorption in the first place? Um, so if you look in literature, you often see diagrams a bit like this one that I'm showing here. Um, and what's going on is that a researcher has done some experimental work. So um, in this case, they've looked at the adsorption of sulfonamides and tetracyclines onto biochars. Um, and they've used their results to infer the mechanisms through which um, these pollutants are absorbing onto the biochar surfaces. Um, so with molecular modeling, you can directly observe these mechanisms. Um, so you can gain atomic level insights into what is happening when pollutants are absorbing onto biochar surfaces. Um, so this is a really great way of understanding what is happening. Um, the other thing is that molecular modeling is systematic and reproducible. Um, so this means we can systematically go through different pollutants um, with different biochars and look at which ones absorb better and hopefully understand why. So it's a really great way of understanding adsorption onto biochar surfaces and hopefully um, gaining insights into how to optimize biochars as adsorbents. Um, so why isn't it being used yet? Um, I think there's two main reasons for this. Um, the first is there's a lack of understanding of the molecular structures within biochars. Um, and this means it's difficult to set up representative molecular models. Um, the second problem is that there are no freely available molecular models of biochars in literature. Um, and this means basically that anyone wanting to model biochars has to start from scratch and has to overcome this barrier of the difficult um, model setup. Um, so both of these things I'm trying to resolve in my work. So I'm hopefully going to develop some molecular models um, and then make them freely available so other people can use them too. Um, so the type of molecular modeling that I use is called molecular dynamic simulation. Um, and it basically uses uh, classical or um, Newtonian mechanics uh, to simulate how a uh, system changes or evolves over time. Um, and in a molecular dynamic simulation, um, we approximate atoms and bonds as balls and springs. Um, and we don't include any electrons in our models. And so this is really important because it means that uh, bonds are fixed throughout our simulation. Um, so we can't make or bake, break bonds during our simulation. Um, there are no chemical transformations. Um, so how does the simulation work? Um, the first thing we do is define the atoms or molecules that we want to simulate. Um, so I'm showing here a toluene molecule. Um, so for each atom in my toluene molecule, um, I'll assign a mass and a charge and an atom type. Um, I'll then look at all the bonds in my molecule um, and assign bond lengths and bond angles. Um, I then assign, there's lots of other properties that we assign. Um, and all of this basically goes into a file which we call the topology file. Um, and this topology file is what a molecular dynamic simulation uses to understand how different molecules interact with one another. Um, so I next put all of the molecules that I want to simulate into a box. Um, so this is what we call a simulation cell. Um, and this is essentially the starting coordinates for our simulation. Um, we can then start our simulation. So we start by calculating the force on every single atom in our simulation cell. Um, and we can use this force to calculate the acceleration of each atom uh, using F equals MA. Um, 
so this acceleration can then uh, we can then use that to work out how much an atom will move after a small time step. So this is normally on the order of around one femtosecond. Um, so we can then move forward by this small time step, um, and we move all of our atomic positions by the amount that we've calculated based on the acceleration. Um, we then repeat this, so we recalculate all our forces, recalculate our accelerations, and then again update our positions. Um, and so this gives us our simulation. Um, and we repeat this many, many times. So a normal time scale in a molecular dynamic simulation is um, like nanoseconds. Um, so for a 30 nanosecond simulation, you might want to repeat this force calculation around 30,000 times. Um, and at the end, uh, we output our new configuration. So this is the final coordinates of all of the atoms in our simulation cell. Um, and this is what we do our analysis on. Um, we can also do our analysis on our actual trajectory. So that's the simulation. Um, but most of the time we just do it on the um, final configuration. Um, so the other thing I just wanna talk about is um, how we simulate the bulk properties of our systems. Uh, so as I've said, the uh, normal time scales and uh, length scales on a, in a molecular dynamic simulation um, is around nano, nanometers and nano, nanoseconds. Um, so what I'm showing in the bottom left is one single simulation cell, and this might be around 10 nanometers cubed. Um, so in dark purple here is all of the atoms which are close to or touching the surface of our simulation cell. Um, and this is a very high proportion of surface atoms compared to what would be in a bulk system. So if we were just to simulate one simulation cell, um, what we would have is not very representative of the bulk. Um, so to counter this, we use periodic boundary conditions. Um, and this is what I'm showing on the right. Um, so basically what we do is we imagine that our simulation cell is repeated infinitely in X, Y, and Z. Um, and so any molecule which leaves the left of our simulation cell will re-enter again through the right. Um, and so we essentially remove the edges of our boxes. Um, so what we simulate is much more representative of the bulk. Um, okay. So hopefully that's everything you need to know about molecular dynamic simulation to understand uh, my work. Uh, sorry. Um, so what I've been doing is simulating uh, biochars, so creating molecular models of biochars. Uh, so how I've been doing it is, first I've defined the properties of the biochars that I want to model. Um, I've then gone through and created molecular building blocks. Um, so these are molecules which are representative of those biochars. Um, I've then used these to simulate bulk, a bulk biochar. So this is periodic in X, Y, and Z. Um, sorry. Um, and then I've created a layer with an exposed surface. So this exposed surface layer is what I can then use to study adsorption. Um, so the first thing I did is define the properties of the biochars that I wanted to model. So I had to think about uh, which biochars uh, I should focus on. Um, and I decided to work with woody biochars because of their low ash content. Um, and this essentially meant I could neglect ash from my models um, while still making sure they were representative. Um, okay. Um, I then decided to look at three different highest treatment temperatures. Um, so this is mostly because the properties of biochars are very much affected by highest treatment temperature. Um, and also uh, the adsorption properties of biochars are affected by highest treatment temperature. Uh, so I decided to work with low, medium and high highest treatment temperatures, which is four, six and 800 degrees C. Um, I then had to think about which uh, properties I wanted to replicate in my models. Um, and I decided to work with uh, properties which gave me kind of chemical insights into the molecular structures of within biochars, and then also true density, which gives me a physical property to work with. 
Um, so I just want to talk about these last two properties that I've mentioned here. So aromaticity index, degree of aromatic condensation um, and true density. Um, so the aromaticity of a biochar can be described in two different ways. Um, the first is the aromaticity index, uh, and this describes the proportion of carbons in a biochar which are aromatic. Uh, the second is the degree of aromatic condensation, uh, and this describes the size of polyaromatic domains within a biochar. Uh, so I've made a little figure here on the right to kind of describe how these two different properties relate to one another. So in the bottom left, uh, you have low aromaticity indices and low aromatic condensations. And these are molecules which you might find uh, similar to those that you'd find in biomass. Uh, and then in the top left, you would have high aromaticity indices and low aromatic condensations. Um, and these are molecules like benzene. Uh, so this is 100% aromatic, but has a domain size of only one. Um, and then as you move towards higher aromatic condensations, um, you increase your domain size until you get to uh, big graphene like sheets. Um, and the other property I just want to talk about was true density, um, mostly because it has lots of different names. So true density is also known as skeletal or particle density. Oh, okay. Um, so skeletal particle density um, or helium density. Um, and basically what it describes is um, the density of a particle, including open or ex uh, closed or inaccessible pores, but excluding open or accessible pores. Um, so basically what it describes is um, the closest measure we can get experimentally to the true or real density of our uh, biochar particles. Um, so the next thing I did was go through literature and collect data uh, showing how the, each of these properties that I wanted to look at um, vary with highest treatment temperature. Um, and I fitted curves to each of my data sets and then used these curves to calculate um, the average value that each of these properties would take um, at the three highest treatment temperatures that I wanted to look at. So that's four, six, eight hundred degrees C. Um, and this is what they were. Um, so as you go to a higher, highest treatment temperature, uh, you decrease HC and OC ratios, um, you increase uh, your aromaticity indices and your aromatic domain sizes, and you increase your true density. Um, I then also went through literature and looked at functional group data, so mostly from FTIR. Um, and this kind of gave me some functional groups that I might want to include in my molecules. Um, and so I have split this into two parts. So I've got chemical properties and physical properties. Um, so chemical properties are those which I can input into my model um, via my molecular building blocks. And the physical properties are those which I will output from my molecular model and then I'll analyze and check that they're um, representative. Um, so the next thing I did was went through and constructed my molecular building blocks. Um, so these are essentially the molecules that I'm using to make up my biochars. Um, and I did this manually. Uh, so I went through uh, using a chemical drawing software and drew out molecules um, which had properties which were aligned to those that I've just shown. Um, I then converted these molecules into a format that I could use in a simulation and assigned my topology files for each of them. Um, so this is what they look like. Uh, on the left is the 400 degree C, middle is 600 and high, uh, right is 800. Um, so for the low uh, highest treatment temperature biochars, uh, we had lots of different functional groups, um, low aromaticity indices and low aromatic domain sizes. Um, and then for the high, highest treatment temperature biochars, we had much higher aromatic domain sizes, um, higher aromaticity indices, and then much uh, fewer functional groups. Uh, and this is just what they look like as simulation input files. Um, so the next thing I did is simulated my bulk biochar. So this is the one which is periodic in X, Y, and Z. Um, 
And I did this essentially by placing each of my molecular building blocks into a simulation cell. And then I started running a simulation. Um, so I started my simulation at a high temperature. And basically this meant that my molecular building blocks uh, were gaseous, so they could move around freely in the simulation cell. Um, and then I cooled my simulation down to room temperature. Uh, and this meant that all of my molecular building blocks condensed into essentially a solid. Um, I then analyzed my output configuration. So I looked at the density and the morphology um, to check that I thought that my structures were representative. Um, and so what I just wanna note here is that I'm not simulating pyrolysis because there's no bond uh, making or breaking. Um, so what I've done is just put input molecules which are representative of the biochars and then condense them into a solid. Um, so this is what they look like. Um, and this is their properties. Um, so for all three, the properties um, align to those that I outlined earlier. Um, so that's good. And my physical properties, which is the ones that are dependent on my simulation also match. So that makes me think that my models are representative, which is good. Um, and then the final thing that I did was created a layer with an exposed surface. Um, so this meant that I could then study adsorption or interfacial properties um, of my biochars. Um, so this is really useful for me in terms of what I want to do next. Um, and how I did this was essentially I took one block of my bulk biochar um, and created a grid as a kind of layer. Um, I then introduced a space into my simulation cell in the Z direction. So this basically meant that there was a space in the top and the bottom of my simulation cell um, so that I had a surface. Um, I then ran a short uh, simulation just to equilibrate my um, newly created surface atoms, basically so that they could move around and find new favorable positions on the surface. Um, and here are my three surfaces. Um, again, they have chemical and physical properties aligned to those that I've outlined earlier. Um, and most importantly, they can be used to study uh, absorption. Uh, which is my future work. Uh, so I will be uh, looking at the absorption of various different pollutants from water onto my biochar surfaces. Um, and the idea will be to look at systematically um, lots of different pollutants um, so that I can understand how biochars, different biochars might um, have different uh, absorption properties basically. Um, and then ultimately to understand how to optimize these different biochars uh, for absorption. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I've been doing. Um, I have developed three representative molecular models of woody biochars produced at low, medium and high, highest treatment temperatures. Um, for each of these, I've created a bulk uh, model, which is periodic in X, Y and Z. Um, and I've created a layer with an exposed surface. Um, and these layers with exposed surfaces uh, can be used to study the interfacial properties of biochars using molecular dynamic simulation. Um, so in my work, this will be to understand the absorption of various different pollutants onto these biochar surfaces. Um, and last but not least, uh, these models will be made hopefully soon, freely available uh, via GitHub. And so this means that anyone who wants to study uh, biochars using molecular dynamic simulation can go to my GitHub page, download my models and use them in their own work. Um, and hopefully this will facilitate the uptake of molecular dynamics in the study of biochars. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions? Thank you very much, Rosie. Uh, very interesting and really uh, very helpful. That's a difference to most presentations, <laughs> um, but always nice to see uh, modeling work. And you got a couple of questions in the chat uh, during the presentations. So I think we can uh, start with them. So uh, the first one was by Rob, who asked, uh, will your models and systems of modeling be available public publicly or through licensing? So I think you already said that. Yeah, yeah. So they're not available yet, but they will be soon. Um, hopefully we'll publish this and then uh, put it all up. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, Shemis, love you raised your hand so you can ask directly. Um, hi, Rosie. It's hi. very lovely presentation. Very interesting research. Um, I have actually like two questions. 
Uh, first one, like it's in your publication, those data would be included. I mean, this summary of the parameters on of, of the biochar, because I'm I'm like working on the CFD modeling of the biomass conversion, and I'm always looking for some nice summary of the parameters. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so if, if that would be available, and uh, may I ask when we can expect this uh, to be seen somewhere in the literature? Yeah, hope hopefully soon. We haven't submitted anything yet, so. Um, but hoping to submit in the near future. Okay, um, fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and the second, the second question would be related to the gas absorption because you mentioned that you will in, uh, investigate the compound expo um, uh, absorption. Yes, so some larger uh, contaminants, yeah. I, I, I suspect. Uh, but have you considered to using these models to analyze the gas absorption? Yeah, so that should uh, be possible. Most of my work will be looking at pollutants from water. So mm -hmm. um, it, yeah, it won't be gas absorption, but it should be equally um, feasible to use these models to, to do that. Mm, that sounds great. I'm, I'm really looking forward uh, to, see, uh, to see this publication. Yes, once again, thank you very much for your presentation. It was great. Thanks. <laughs> uh, thanks, Shemislav. And I think Shemislav is also interested in uh, modeling um, Swelling of biochar during gas absorption. Um, indeed, indeed. <laughs> um, so the next question from Rob was, um, do you believe it may someday be possible to use AI algorithms to generate protocols for manufacturing designer biochars capable of selective absorbency for environmental management? Um, so basically, design can you design biochar based on your models at some point? I think, yeah, hope, hopefully that will be the end goal. Um, we want to write a program that will, um, essentially you can input a temperature and it will spit you out a biochar model, um, which then can be used kind of in the same way to study all the different properties across these different temperatures. Um, but yeah, it's probably a, a long way away to get AI algorithms working yet. Um, but hopefully soon, yeah. <laughs> And then the next question from Agnieszka. Uh, can you use your models to study electrosorption as well? Um, what does electrosorption mean? Um, so, uh, <clears throat> Agne Agnieszka. Hi, yeah. Hi hello. Uh, by electrosorption, I mean um, there, are, there have been um, studies to use uh, carbon materials and biochars as well as uh, in uh, um, supercapacitors or in um, the ionization uh, processes uh, where basically the, the, the um, char is charged, electrically charged, and it's uh, attracting uh, ions, for example, from the water. Um, in, and it's entrapping the, the ions within the charge fraction as the double electrical layer. So whether it would be because there is no there is no chemical reaction on it. So, but yeah. it's just changing the, the 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 charges of the atoms of the of the char, I guess. So, uh, I, I I expect you you could probably use these models for for such purposes as well. Yeah. So we uh, you can't change the charge on the biochar at any point, um, but you could if you were just looking at say a positively charged biochar surface and neg or negatively charged biochar surface and some positive ions. Um, mm -hmm. You could see how they absorb onto it. Mm -hmm. um, so that is feasible. One of the things that I'm doing at the moment is trying to deprotonate my biochar. So essentially make a negatively charged surface so that you kind of do that kind of thing. Um, but it's at the moment, all of my biochars are neutral. So it might not be as interesting of a, of a thing to study at the moment with that. Mm -hmm. But it's possible for you to, in the future, to... to uh, yeah, that's kind of hopefully mm -hmm. something I'm doing at the moment. <laughs> okay, that's, that's great. That's yeah. great. Thank you. Um, and I think we have a, a time for a follow-up question that uh, from Rob. Oh, follow-up. It somehow connects to that. Um, can you change... Um, can you model change properties uh, over time somehow? Or do you think that could be adapted, your models, so that uh, the biochar properties change over time during its option. Um, what in, ter in terms of... Um, if they're exposed to water, for example, so they leach out, I mean, you don't really have uh, metals in there. Um, 
Yeah, so, so th uh, the thing that is, is difficult is that you can't change the uh, chemical structure during a simulation, but you can change the chemical structure before or after your simulation and then um, like re-simulate it essentially. Um, so potentially it would be difficult to watch something deprotonate or protonate or anything change, but you could uh, do two different ones and compare them. Um, okay, now we have to select uh, questions because um, I think we were running over time. Otherwise, um, so there was an easy one, I think, uh, for your simulation, which software are you using for molecular dynamics? Um, I am using Gromax. So um, it's quite a common software. It's free to download um, and quite relatively easy to use. So it should hopefully be accessible to lots of people. Uh, okay, great. Rosie, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, and uh, if there are two more questions in the chat, so if you're around for another two minutes, you might yeah. be able to answer them. And they're new coming, so yeah. <laughs> thank you very much, Rosie. Cool, thank you.